I grew up on a family farm uh, that my grandfather uh, you know, acquired in 1905, and then my folks took it over in 1946, and that's where I grew up on the family farm. It was a general northwest Missouri farm with livestock and cattle and hogs and corn and hay and lots of hay, and, and uh, so that's where I grew up and I uh, went to a small school. There were 16 in my high school class and uh, went to college, uh, first of all, to Grayson College in Mona, Iowa, just kind of a general college curriculum, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And uh, the only thing I'd been uh, drilled from the time I was a little guy is that uh, you're going to get a college education and get off this poor farm. So uh, that was the number one objective. But after a couple of years of that, it, it was obvious I needed to focus a little closer to something that I had uh, some awareness and knowledge of, and that was the agricultural field. So I transferred out to Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, and did a major in general agriculture, and which was, in hindsight, 2020, a, a wonderful opportunity to get a, a diversity of, uh, of academic uh, background and training uh, in the general ag field because of a little everything, and graduated in 1963 with a BS in general ag. Then uh, trying to find a job being the top priority and a little difficult to find a, a good ag opening in the hometown area, but uh, we kept kept searching and searching and we heard on the radio one day that there was an opening for a farm broadcasting position at KFEQ Radio. And so it was in the ag field at least. So I just walked in the door, fill out an application and amazingly enough, they hired me as a uh, assistant farm director in 1964. Before I, you know, I guess my earliest days, uh, it would be, be my high school basketball coach, uh, Ernie Connell, who uh, I grew to really respect because he instilled, you know, uh, work ethic uh, as beyond maybe even our farm work ethic, which we never had a shortage of. But, uh, you know, he talked to you know, he, he really taught us how to win. And in any profession, you have to know a formula, find a formula for winning, and to know that you're not gonna hit a home run every time, but uh, that you end up with a successful season of, of your career if you uh, really know uh, the kind of dedication it takes to make it happen. And the other person that I would say is in the broadcast side of the career would be uh, uh, Bob Smith, who I worked for as, as uh, the station general manager for 27 years or whatever. He was the owner of the station, but a, a, a really a, a top flight business manager and broadcaster. He understood what broadcasting, local broadcasting was all about, and he allowed me to have the freedom to uh, pursue the course that uh, we chose to follow, and, and I was always very supportive, and, and for that I'm most appreciative. Uh, in the other aspects of my broadcast career, I suppose in the in the farm arena, uh, particularly when it moved over into the sales and marketing aspects, I would have to mention Glenn Comerow, who was a longtime agricultural sales uh, representative for for the Cats uh, rep firm, representative firm. Uh, Glenn was just a storehouse of knowledge and information and encouragement and uh, respect. Uh, throughout the entire farm broadcast industry, and, and he's a person that uh, I always felt gave me uh, nothing but 100% uh, good advice, and I always appreciate his input. The uh, other person that I uh, would like to acknowledge as being perhaps the closest thing to a mentor is George Logan. Uh, George Logan uh, had a similar career path as I did. I started as a farm broadcaster, worked for USDA in Washington, D.C., and subsequently at WLW in Cincinnati, and, and uh, then moved to Topeka, Kansas. And uh, George and I became acquainted and worked uh, side by side on various events throughout uh, the local area of northeast Kansas, northwest Missouri, to see a lot of meetings. And subsequent to his year as president of NAFP, uh, he was named the general manager of WIBW in Topeka. And little did I know that, uh, you know, just three or four years later, you know, that same opportunity would uh, be laid in front of me to uh, move from full-time just farm broadcaster to the general manager of the operation. And 
and uh, be able to, you know, make sure that that farm broadcasting, uh, you know, had its best presence on the station and and had its uh, value uh, throughout the organization. So uh, George has been a longtime friend and and uh, associate, and uh, you know, I highly respect his judgment and his encouragement. And uh, as we fought some of the battles up and down the hill. Well, technology when we started was pretty meager uh, because there was, uh, you know, very little in the way of uh, recording equipment available that was portable. Now, we did have uh, a little portable uh, reel-to-reel recorder that uh, would use those little, uh, what, three-inch uh, reels. It took about four uh, AA, or four uh, C batteries in order to power it. And... You know, that made us at least uh, portable and then get out and, you know, do the interviews and meetings and, and events around the area. And so that was that was something that we could take with us as we're out there on the road. But uh, getting those feeds back was strictly telephone and finding a telephone because that was long before cell phones and finding a, a usable telephone and then mastering things like alligator clips and... Uh, voice acts and things that you could screw on certain phones and then plug your recorder in. So it was uh, it was it was pretty meager in terms of technology at that point in time and we just did a lot of uh, programming live. All of the uh, commercial record or commercials at the station were either done live or, or were on a, a tape cassette or a tape uh, cart we call a cart machine. And that of course evolved into uh, you know the cassette players and lighter portable uh, equipment that was able to, you know, stick in your pocket and uh, travel. So it, it really uh, it really changed pretty quickly in the uh, in the 70s, but uh, we were still reliant a whole lot on the telephone system in order to get our broadcast back on the air. If we were out at a meeting, why, you know, you had to be on a phone in your hotel room or find a phone booth someplace, then of course the phone booths we found out were hardwired. Uh, welded together so you couldn't take the phone apart. <laughs> so you had to find a place where you could take the phone apart in order to plug in your equipment. But, uh, you know, that evolved and changed uh, through an evolution of technologies and so that, uh, you know, as the digital world came about, why there was just a dramatic uh, ability in order to get uh, your broadcast back, you know, into the studio or on the air. And we saw the industry changing along that same time as uh, farm networks were incubating in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, distribution for the networks was uh, a real challenge. Some of the early networks were distributed by cassette tapes in the mail. And so you had weak old material by the time it hit the air, and that's not what radio is all about. Uh, some did end up uh, with some telephone lines uh, fixed in to their affiliated stations then the advent of satellite communications really uh, changed that whole picture as, as uh, farm broadcasters were able to plug into uh, the satellite uh, systems and uh, be able to you know, get those feeds to the stations. The biggest change to the broadcast industry would have to be the change in FCC rules on ownership. Uh, because in the uh, 60s and 70s and 80s, there were ownership restrictions uh, placed by the FCC that you could only own, uh, you know, so many AM and FM stations. And that ownership was, uh, you know, a national ownership. And so I think it was at one time 3 AM and 3 FM stations. Then it was changed to 7 AM and 7 FM stations. But uh, that, that really, you had a diversity of ownership. A lot of uh, entrepreneurial owners, that started stations and owned their stations. They may have been regional in, in their ownership of their stations, maybe uh, only in one or two or three markets at most. Uh, but with the relaxation of ownership rules, it opened the floodgate for consolidations and mergers. And uh, it started out with just uh, ownership of stations, and then it got to be groups of stations and then clusters of stations. And so you had a total transformation from local ownership, local management, local control to a corporate uh, presence.
transportation that uh, you know has a whole different set of priorities and is uh, probably more acutely revenue driven and uh, trying to adopt technology as a technology allowed some of those mergers and uh, acquisitions to become economically feasible. But uh, it has really changed the structure of the uh, broadcast industry because of the change in ownership rules which take, took place in the late 1990s. I was on the National Association of Broadcasters Board of Directors in Washington, D.C. at the time that those policy discussions were, were being undertaken. And I don't think anyone could foresee with the, the cl cl clarity the, uh, the amount of impact that that would have uh, when you took off uh, the ownership uh, restrictions because it really did change dramatically uh, how broadcasting uh, itself functioned internally. I think there was a lot of things lost uh, in that. Uh, like say, you, you lost the local uh, local community input uh, to a large degree. Yes, there are market managers and there's market programmers and so forth, but uh, so many things were being cloned uh, because of efficiency and just mass distribution where you could produce a program at one place and distribute it at, at 100 or 200 or 300 locations. And so from an efficiency standpoint, it looked really good. But from a local uh, service perspective, in my opinion, there was a lot lost in that uh, in that conversion uh, because uh, radio is an everyday business and it's people to people and one on one. Uh, it it really is not a mass media as uh, some would think it would be because most individuals listen to radio by themselves. Uh, it's not like going to a theater, uh, and uh, so. Every individual would like to think that that is their radio station and they know the person that's on the air. There's a personal relationship that exists there and that's probably the, still the main strength of farm broadcasting as it uh, is being uh, used today in many, many markets is there is that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship tie between the broadcaster and that person out there in the audience that's tuned in every day. Well, I think farm broadcasting uh, role is going to be just as vital in the future as it has been in the past, but that role has changed and, and evolved over time. Uh, when, we, when I first started, I mean, a lot of our broadcasts were on a how-to-farm type program. Well, the technology and the educational level and the technological development and acquisition of the farm community is evolved so fast that that is not the focus today. It's, it's issue oriented. It's uh, how do we deal in a world of uh, regulatory constraints, uh, consumer activism, uh, uninformed consumers, uh, dealing with an audience that is uh, diverse and perhaps three or four generations removed from the realities of, of the farm and what it takes to put food on the table. And so I think that the uh, future of agriculture communications is, is extraordinary and very diverse and could not be more important uh, than it is today because uh, this world is, is seeking for, for, uh, for food and nutrition and energy and, and all, of the, uh, all of the things which agriculture brings to the table, but there's a, a great void sometimes in the understanding of what uh, farm producers go through in order to provide uh, the bountiful supplies which we have available to us in this nation and around the world. I think that, that telling the story, understanding the story, it's, it's a technical story. You have to have a tremendous background and diversity of background to understand uh, the dynamics of, of agronomics, of animal, of animal agriculture, and uh, you know, dispel some of the myths that are perpetrated out there by special interest groups that that try to try to say that uh, you know that all of uh, all of agriculture is like a factory farm, and and uh, they really really don't understand that there's real life human beings, uh, family entrepreneurs that are that are the vast majority of uh, what's producing food and fiber in this country.